that's what's so beautiful. You know, when you make something, if you're part of the creation of something, mm-hmm. you have to let it go. You know, it'll come back to you in many, many ways. And at the same time, mm. everybody wants to make it their own. Everyone, I notice on Instagram, every girl, one beautiful girl after another is thinking that she really is that Pari. Mm. So my, my mission is accomplished. <laughs> Namaste and welcome to Music Mehfil India. Our guest today is the original Pari Sunita Rao. In this wonderful conversation, Sunita has generously shared her vast experience going from musical theatre to becoming a Hindi pop star. This conversation is loaded with valuable insights and takeaways for anyone who wishes to do music and art for life. I'm Aruna Jade, a composer and singer, and it is my privilege to host this series where we talk to the Davids and the Goliaths, the loners and the tribes of the music scene, for these are the stories of music from India. So hi and welcome <laughs> to my humble studio Miss Sunita Rao the original pari how are you today I am very well and thank you for having me here and it's so great to do this with you uh-huh. since we've been on stage together and you have given me so much of lovely support <laughs> the the opportunity the pleasure was all mine thank you so much absolutely all right so please tell me how did music begin for you So I come from a musical family. My mother is a like classical singer, and she has released several albums with uh, then erstwhile HMV mm-hmm. and um, uh, Ghazals, Geet, Bhajan. You know, mm-hmm. so that's what that's what she does. Mm-hmm. And um, so my I've just grown up listening to her singing, and that's mainly been my my mm-hmm. musical education more than anything else. And uh, of course, I did a little bit of Carnatic music, did a little bit of Hindustani music. and uh, like all good south indian girls did my bharatnatyam <laughs> and um i was actually originally really focused on doing only bharatnatyam and i was mm-hmm. kid but there were many many things that happened because of which i couldn't complete the arangetram mm. and i had a, a braid which was up to my hips mm-hmm. and after my third attempt i was mm. so disillusioned that it didn't happen that i went and chopped off my braid and joined jazz ballet Oh and uh, that's how I met uh, Carla Singh and Shamak Davar and and so began my musical theatre career. What year was this? So I did a uh, musical theatre from 83 to 88. Uh-huh. And uh, the first musical I did some other stuff in between before which were not worth mentioning but the first proper musical that I did was Evita. Mm. And I joined them during the 71st show. Their 71st show. And this is in Mumbai. This is in Mumbai. And mm-hmm. then subsequently we went to Delhi and Pune and everything. Mm-hmm. And um, during the hundredth show of Evita, mm. Alec uh, Alec Padamsi, mm. who was uh, who was directing it, and uh, he came to me and he said, "Listen, um, Alisha is not going to be able to do the hundredth show." So Alisha Chennai. Alisha Chennai. Oh. And um, uh, I knew all the music by heart, I like the back of my hand. I knew the lyrics. I knew the tunes. I was crazy about it, you know. and uh, he said will you please fill in for her we have nobody to play uh, peron's mistress mm. that was the role that she was playing and uh, i said well, i'd love to do it but on one condition which is you give me a new costume mm. <laughs> so actually the costume was a night dress mm. <laughs> and she holds a still a teddy bear in her hand and she sings this beautiful song another suitcase in another hall mm. and um, i said yeah i'll do it and that was my debut so to speak mm. after which uh, carla asked me to audition for greece mm. i was actually wanting to do a rizzo's uh, role everybody mm. wants to be the bad girl mm. <laughs> but they were like no 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 you please sing hopelessly devoted to you because we want you to do sandy mm. and i did um, i did end up playing the lead role in that and it was during greece mm. that sanjeev kohli from hmv mm-hmm. he uh, he came for the show uh, he knew my mother and he spotted me and said i would like you to do a hindi pop album mm. but in those days of course one had one's nose up in the air one was in sanjeevs one was doing musical theater so mm. there was no question of doing um hindi pop but i became wiser later couple of years later after i did a little bit of hindustani training uh-huh. and 
I went back to them and said, okay, I'm ready. And we did Senorita. Tell me about Senorita. Oh, I had the opportunity of working with Louis Banks. Hmm. And he was the most lovely human being to begin my career with. Mm -hmm. And he launched me in a program called Pop Time. Mm. Um, and Sunita Senorita was the name of the album. And he said, are you ready for the flamenco? Everyone, please welcome the lady who will make you dance and sing. You know, please welcome Sunita Rama. It was just the most incredible launch I could have asked for. So where was Pop Time uh, broadcast? Pop Time was on National Network on Doordarshan. So uh -huh. I truly am grateful that I got the most lucky beginning mm -hmm. and uh, that was where I wore that red and black skirt and the big red flower in my hair so you, you everyone calls me OG Pari I'm also OG senorita <laughs> <laughs> hmm. as in you know and I, I kind of like I had this habit I think I mentioned mm -hmm. of uh, announcing myself mm -hmm. so even in this one it was like Paheli hu main akeli hu in fizao ki main saheli hu all that kind of thing I am this mm -hmm. and I am that you know and then naam hai mera senorita you know mm -hmm. that kind of thing so and it was all flamenco guitar and all that good mm -hmm. fun and then uh, how did dua come about so a couple of years uh, after I did uh, Senorita, I was doing a lot of jingles mm -hmm. and I was friendly with a lot of people in the advertising industry and Leslie Lewis was doing a lot of jingles mm -hmm. and I approached him to do uh, Dhuwa. I worked a lot with him. We did many jingles together as, mm -hmm. as did I with Louis and Ronnie Desai and, you know, mm -hmm. Esan Nurani. A lot of uh, uh, wonderful producers at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Leslie and me had already had a great working relationship. So doing an album was just like an ex extension of it. Mm -hmm. And that's how Dhuwa happened. Yeah, Right. And so what's the story behind Pali Hume? So, like I said, I, my, I, I had like a working relationship with Leslie and he mm. knew I had all these ideas of uh, what I wanted from this album. I was extremely clear that um, Senorita was essentially just Hindi pop. Mm -hmm. It was Western contemporary music with Hindi lyrics. Mm. So I had a Hindi lyricist and I had Louis for the music and my inputs were all the themes and concepts behind the songs. Mm -hmm. Like I would say, uh, I want to sing about the unnecessary. I had a little bit of a social conscience, like right from the beginning, I wanted to always make a little bit of a difference in whatever music. I didn't want it to just be music for the sake of music, but I also mm. knew it was a platform for me to voice my, my, my thoughts and my feelings. Um, um, and so there was a song called Pesa, you know, mm. which said, Haatho mein aake bhi rukta nahi hai ye pesa. Paise ki piche zamana divana hai kaisa. Again, Rajesh Johari. So mm. I would tell him that I want to say this, 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 and he would put it beautifully, poetically. So similarly, right. that's what happened with Pari. Mm -hmm. There was, um, I love one of my favorite tunes in Bollywood. Mm. Yesterday, Bollywood was Bichua. Mm, which went yeah. as dayari, dayari, chad gayo papi, bichua. Mm. I liked the meter of it mm -hmm. and I was also very influenced by an album that I was listening to of Paul Simon mm -hmm. called Rhythm of the Saints mm -hmm. I was greatly influenced by that album and there was one of my favorite tunes of all time on it called Further to Fly and it had that lovely lilt to it that tung, ta, ta, tung, ta, 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 ta. Mm. it had that lilt to it Right. so I played these as references to Les and I said look let's create something of our own which with these influences and he did a great job of it. it he created something completely different but still with the sentiment that I wanted mm -hmm. and as far as the lyrics were concerned mm -hmm. again I had incredible support from Johri ji mm -hmm. uh, I still remember sitting with him in my mother's house mm -hmm. with the ocean on one side and I was telling I was feeling very good about myself in those days obviously <laughs> and as a result of which <laughs> anybody who listens to that tune feels good about themselves and I think that's mm -hmm. actually the magic of Pari mm -hmm. and because of my mom's uh, ghazal influences I told him I wanted to use Urdu mm -hmm. and I said I don't care if nobody understands the meaning of mm -hmm. the words yeah. he says can I use words like gurur and surur I said please use them because I want I essentially want the words to caress people when they listen to it mm -hmm. and that was my intention and I'm so happy to see and I'm so I'm moved to tears so many times when people come to me and tell me that that's exactly what happened to them mm -hmm. there are people who have come to me and said that we put it on a, in those days they had cassettes. Mm -hmm. So they would loop it and just play from yeah. beginning to end the same song over and over. I just couldn't believe it. And people have come to me and said, we've named our child after you or we got mm -hmm. married because of you. We had our first date because of you. So those things are precious. They're just something that I just, you know, I don't think anything else that I've done in my life has come close to that. Was, 
was that a bit overwhelming also on some level you know i never had a chance to really get too overwhelmed because it all happened so slowly mm. you know pari got introduced to everybody once again i had the opportunity again on doordarshan national network because last minute i had to sing for the film fair awards mm-hmm. uh, dear the late pradeep guha who gave me the opportunity last minute to sing pari ho main in front of the entire nation mm. uh I did it in a white sequence sari I don't know if you remember and then I just like went off in the middle and came back in a bustier and a mini skirt and did it's my life <laughs> so I don't think anybody would ever forget it so mm. once again recall factor and um, mm. then it became very popular in fashion shows yes and so you know and I would be in the fashion shows singing and sometimes they would use it as a track for the models to walk on mm. and uh, but they were already crazy about it and they would tell me oh we're going to be walking on your song or something like that you know so and then it became uh, popular in Dandia yeah did and, you ever uh, see that happening oh yeah very often I've been invited as guest chief guest and stuff in many Dandia races Falguni herself I mean she was like she went prostrate in front of me when she actually <laughs> touched my feet when I when I saw everyone from mm-hmm. Falguni to Sunidhi to my girl next door I mean everybody mm-hmm. wants to make it their own mm-hmm. and that's what's so beautiful you know when you make something if you're part of the creation of something mm-hmm. you have to let it go mm-hmm. and um you know it'll come back to you in many many ways and at the same time mm. everybody wants to make it their own mm-hmm. like I, i often give this example of new york city whenever mm. i go to new york yeah. anyone who goes to new york feels it's their own city mm. so everyone i notice on instagram every girls one beautiful girl after another is thinking that she really is that pari mm. so my, my mission is accomplished <laughs> how did you go about making that video pari ho mai pari ho mai actually uh again from the advertising world mm mm-hmm. so ram madhwani mm mm-hmm. a very dear friend of my sister and i had done an ad with him and uh i we had no money mm. i had to beg and borrow and uh, god knows what else steal not really but mm. you know knocking on all these big but corporation but there was no label or manager involved no the the album was releasing through hmv but they didn't have a budget for the for video for the video right or uh, not did they make any attempt to get a budget so mm-hmm. i had to do that and uh, my uncle from sister's advertising he gave mm-hmm. me 1 lakh mm-hmm. colgate toothpaste gave me 2 lakhs wow and we had just 3 lakhs and ram just created magic created magic with that uh, hardly you can't even call it money mm. but you know he had his own inter- interpretation of the song which a lot of people are, are discussing it in various ways they have got so many different po- points of view to interpret it and i'm mm. great with that i mean the more you you know art is open to so much of appreciation so that's just terrific but uh, the most beautiful thing was that i had mickey contractor um for makeup i had hemant trivedi and zaksis patena for costume mm. and gautam rajdaksh was taking photographs anil mm. mehta was the cinematographer who also played the role of the professor mm. i was working with all words at that time and i was 19 20 years old you know i mean mm. couldn't ask for a better break yeah and uh, so those are all the reasons that the video became so special was it common for uh, uh, folks like yourself to go independent making video You know I don't think really too many of us were doing this because mm-hmm. it was so difficult. I mean the yeah. Bollywood dominated industry mm-hmm. obviously is difficult to do anything independent then and there were no independent artist platforms like you have today. Mm-hmm. Um and uh, and so I'm so happy first of all about my exposure to the advertising world because of whom I had all these you know mm-hmm. experienced people working with me but also incredible family support. Mm. I didn't even my sister and my brother-in-law made the video of uh, Dhaka Dhaka and uh-huh. Kesariya uh-huh. you know and they uh, didn't in any way say how can you do this what will the record company say they said no if you feel you got to do it do it so I made the video sent it directly to MTV mm-hmm. um much to the dismay of the company executives but then I gathered all my guts and I went with my uncle and sat in that mm. big office and I said I'm sorry I I had to do this because you were not doing it Mm. you know and uh, and that's how this so called indie pop industry even got created with a few people like me and mm. and uh, baba saigal mm. and um, you know uh, Sh- uh, shan mm-hmm. uh, alisha all of us we, we just said to hell with it no, nobody's doing it so let's do it mm. so we we kind of put a foot in the door for independent artists mm. um it was it was really difficult 
but I had to do it because I didn't I didn't have the opportunity to express myself musically in Bollywood. Hmm. And uh, Louis and Leslie and Ranjit and all these people were there to work with. Mm. They were not working in movies and I wanted to work with them. Mm. Not that I didn't knock on all the doors. I mean, everybody who's singing in India wants to sing in a movie. It wasn't as much of a priority for me because mm. I loved so much other music and I wanted to create other music which was not being made in movies. Mm. It would have been nice to have a couple of playback hits up my sleeve. I worked with everyone from from Bappida to Anu Malik to Anand Raja, Anand, Anand Milind, even LP mm. I, I, with whom I did Gupt. What was uh, the live part of this music? So live music just came to me. I'm mm-hmm. so grateful because I am basically a people person. Mm-hmm. I like to be, I like to have my audience right in front of me. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it just crept up on me. And uh, I was actually making all kinds of plans. Mm-hmm. I wanted to do economics. I wanted to do musical theater abroad. Mm-hmm. And I was actually making applications for all these things. Mm-hmm. But then suddenly I would get a show. And I would not mm. be able to go. I even got called for a recording with A.R. Rahman. I did a mm. beautiful song with him. And mm. I got a call back. He mm-hmm. said, come for the second recording. But I had to go to Sharjah. Mm. And all the big four teams were there. It was a mm. massive show. I went with my full group of dancers. And I remember I had 102 fever. Mm. But I brought the house down with those with the cricketers. I had Vaseem Akram and um, Azaruddin and all of mm. them were there and they were competing competing with each other singing Kesariya. <laughs> <laughs> so I missed out on doing a second recording with Rahman and I regret that to this day but one mm. has to make a choice. Mm. And uh, I was able to do 25 years on the road. I did like a 12 city tour when Abke Baras was released. What, what were some of these cities? So we did... Um, we did the usual Calcutta, Pune, Goa, but we even did Bhubaneswar, we did uh, Patna. How organized <sighs> was this back then? Omar Haider, bless him. Huh. He organized the whole thing and he treated us really, really well. And he's a mm. good, good friend of mine to this day. Even though we had limited budgets to work with, mm-hmm. he paid me very decently for those days mm-hmm. and uh, made sure that we were comfortable, even though sometimes we were doing never-ending bus journeys and train journeys. You know, I remember once I had a 14-hour bus journey to Bhubaneswar. Mm -hmm. I reached in pieces. I I was just, I had no energy to speak. Mm. So I said, I'm not doing sound check. I'm not doing anything. I went straight into my hotel room and crashed. Mm. I woke up, put my makeup on and went on to stage. Wow. No warm-up, nothing. And it was Mm. the best gig of the whole tour. (laughs) Nice. So, yeah, life on the road was mm. just fabulous. I mean, mm. um, of course, there were also instances when we had to go to Kajurao. Mm-hmm. We landed in Kajurao on the tarmac and we were told that we were not going to be able to get off the aircraft because there was some problem on the runway. Mm. I think there was a wild animal on the one runway or I don't know what. Oh. So, I think we were there for about nine or ten hours stuck in the aircraft and then it turned around and we had to come back. So we never ended up doing the show. <laughs> and we had such a blast. Avid mm. Dias, my choreographer, mm. and me and the rest of the group, we were just giggling, 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 laughing through the whole day, sitting on the aircraft. <laughs> How long were the tours back then? 12 city tours. So we like, um, this was over a period of two to three months. Right. But sometimes I would have 12 shows in one month. Huh. And sometimes I would have one or two. It was just depending on the season and yeah, you know, yeah. whatever. But I never really had a manager. Hmm. So, I mean, people would call me directly and I would uh, give a quote for the show. Mm-hmm. I had a book full of quotes. <laughs> and whichever of them worked out, I would go and do to the best of my ability. How, how did you maintain your health through all this? You know, Aruna, that's a really good question because very, very often I would have to go on to st- a stage with fever and mm. uh, I would like be stuffed with antibiotics because I had to deliver. Mm. But um, I think overall, my, my father was a doctor, so he, mm. he looked after me. I mean, he made sure that I had the right kind of nutrition. Did he and I toll take... with you? My father came with me to Sharjah. It took a toll on my vocal health a little bit. I had mm. a little bit of vocal abuse in those days. We didn't have the right, we didn't have Indian monitors and all. And I had to scream over the 5,000 strong audience. Mm. So that was difficult for me. And I kind of lost my voice at some point And I had to just stay quiet for one month. Mm. I had to go abroad and get a bunch of vocal therapy things done. But then I came back and I did Man of La Mancha. I did mm. the musical because of 
incredible tools that were given to me which i use mm. to this day and, and i recorded my album apke uh, baras also after that mm-hmm. so i'm talking about the 90s that was uh, 98 yeah i wish i wish more and more people would learn about the technique yeah. of healthy vocal singing and i'm i'm so happy in fact some of my backing vocalist vocalists mm. and uh, other people who i've worked with and even my contemporary singers mm-hmm. a lot of them have gotten into teaching and are teaching vocal technique so that's yes. fabulous okay one of your favorite memories on stage actually there have been a million favorite moments uh, while singing pari mm mm-hmm. because uh, i've seen i've seen the chemistry between people and their relationships hmm. just blossoming in front of me while i'm singing that song so that there's no substitute for that really hmm. you know or you know an old lady has been lifted from her chair and she comes and dances to it or i have like a string of 20 little bachus all going but we who may feeling very happy mm-hmm. you know <laughs> so that's just happiness if mm-hmm. you're singing and somebody's doing that in front of you that's happiness uh after one of the shows um a little girl came up to me and uh, she just took this little chain off her neck and she had tears in her eyes and she had a little demonte s on it mm-hmm. and her name was sana and she said uh auntie i'd like you to have this and um, another memory i keep keep uh, recalling when i'm asked this question is when i was mm. not singing one of my own songs it was whitney's song mm. it was i will always love you and uh, i i have not ever I, for the most part of my career i haven't been fortunate enough to use a live band so mm. i've had to create all my minus one tracks and take them with me today they're available dime a dozen mm. so my track that i had the uh, sound engineer had to be very familiar with it mm-hmm. and i think for for this particular gig i couldn't take my engineer for whatever reason it was a mm. very very big gig in calcutta the fikki gig mm. and i had like yash chopra and all quite a few biggies in the audience and there's a silence in the track uh-huh. so he he didn't know that it continues after that and so he stopped it mm. so i had to end up singing the entire thing in i mean a cappella basically uh-huh. and it was pin drop silence and nobody was murmuring or sh- or shifting or you know and then when i finished there was mm. that half a second more of silence and then an a roar from the audience mm. that is something which i mean why else i mean of course we are on stage because we love what we do but more mm. than anything else if you hear that kind of appreciation it just makes you think okay i ha- i'm meant to be here mm. so i want to ask you more about collaborations uh how have they panned out uh yeah. since the 90s i did a beautiful collaboration with the late kk mm according to me he was one of the best voices in the industry true um i i have a very dear friend in the industry his name is zubin balapuria mm-hmm. no new person to the music scene and he produced this song for channel v mm-hmm. it was for an album called jamin mm where all of us were just supposed to choose somebody who we had to so so indiscreet also collaborated with somebody and i collaborated with kk and mm. it was a duet called mujhe pyar ho gaya mm. and i think it's one of the best ballads ever written ever mm. and i'm including hindi film songs with it wow um and i had a dream of one, one day singing it with kk on stage so and he was also a dear friend and i know that one day i will do it and i will have somebody saying it instead of him hmm. but this is one loss that i f- i really feel greatly hmm. because i would have loved to sing that song on stage with him then i did a, a dance collaboration hmm. where i was singing and this wonderful flamenco dancer bettina hmm. uh, from spain she's a swiss lady who does flamenco and has been living hmm. in sevilla from the age of 18 hmm. so she did a production of draupadi where she was draupadi and oh. she used two kathakali dancers as um rushasana and bheem hmm. and she had an Argen- argentinian guitar player bass player hmm. and an um a spanish guitar player and the kerala keli drummers oh the massive beautiful production which we did in agra in front of the taj mahal hmm. and i was the voice of krishna hmm. so i did the vishnu sahasranam in front of the taj mahal Mm. while the vastraharan was going on they used sunzara mm. which was my song for the girl child mm. and uh, it was absolutely one of the most memorable experiences i've ever had 
do you uh, do these themes occur to you naturally like the ones behind sunzara or uh, dehka dehka so the thing is you know uh some of the collaborations have just been organic like i said and some mm. of them have been because i've had the support system with me which is like my sister mm-hmm. uh making dehka dehka and uh i've whenever i have recorded anything with my producers see like i told you i never had management but i had producers mm. so um because i'm not the, the quintessential singer songwriter mm. although i have written lyrics and i only really used my own lyrics in vakt Hmm. or indian girl which is actually hmm. uh, what is available on artists aloud what hmm. you can hear is called indian girl and there are five songs from hmm. that whole album which was originally supposed to be called vak hmm. uh so there i kind of co-wrote with uh, sangeet jino and sheldon hmm. so the albums that were produced i managed to get my videos um uh made by my my sister and brother in law and we did it in ritigram hmm. and uh, daksha setri the choreography and hmm. we used the kalari pai to dancers in hmm. dekha dekha then in kesariya we did the whole dance dance thing with children mm-hmm. so yeah these are things which uh, when we were making the tunes themselves we said we could actually make a video which could have this mm-hmm. but then the whole idea of the blast furnace and all that was my sister and brother in laws because they had access to these places to the mm-hmm. granite quarry also which we used so because they had a friend who owned a quarry so you know mm. those locations were used because of it some of the things were organic and some of them were actually planned and some just happened because people had connections and had mm. access to it wow and going back to a question which you asked me about the girl child yeah. so basically i've been the spokesperson of ladli mm-hmm. which is an a girl child initiative of population first mm. which is run uh, well managed the executive trustee is my uncle bobby sister mm. and uh, dr sharda and uh, they are very well known for the ladli media awards mm-hmm. where we recognize you know an honor mm-hmm. uh, any gender sensitive work and uh, so i've kind of worked with them been on panels monitored panels and uh, um given talks to uh, mm-hmm. school children and they do a hell of a lot of field work uh, i've been on the jury for the ladli media awards i've hosted the ladli media awards and uh, so this was a video that we made um in collaboration with UNFPA hmm. they sponsored it and uh, my husband uh, uh, DOP Jason West he shot it and Rachel Rubin directed it she hmm. was in Xavier's with me and she was in Evita with me hmm. it was lovely how i've known all these people and been able to speak to them and even though like i said budget restrictions but what a video she made it was about basically appealing to women also in the lyric Hmm. um don't push me don't force me don't hurt me you know appealing yeah. to them not to take bull and to just speak hmm. up for themselves if you can share your observations about uh how the times have changed from the point of view of performances as well as the recording process as well as the song making process you know one thing that i'm really really very very grateful for mm. is that nobody ever told me what i could record and not record mm. i have recorded everything from dhamal mm. which is a six language six beat uh song from the album senorita where i did mm. in in english hindi gujarati bengali marathi and punjabi mm. every verse was in a different language and the rhythm changed according to that and we used to have mm. a blast doing it on stage and dancers would come on in different costumes and and do it that and and then i had a like from dhamal to dhua mm. which was like a rock and blues tune mm. then there's pari which had mm. this whole folky influence parwana deewana which had sitar in it mm-hmm. um you know there was a break dance tune on dhua on a uh, senorita mm-hmm. called sani dham and uh, you know i had complete and full freedom and, and just creative freedom to do whatever i wanted mm-hmm. you know nobody was my manager and, and i afterwards i kept thinking maybe it would have been good to have a manager but you know in those days there was a, um, even a limited amount that i would charge mm-hmm. for my shows so i said if i'm going to just be making this much i don't want to go give 20% of it to somebody else you know mm-hmm. and i i was young and you know just gung ho i thought i could do everything mm mm-hmm. you know from producing my shows to figuring out whom i'm going to do my album with to what i'm going to wear how my makeup's going to be who i'm going to use for makeup every single decision in my life for better or for worse hmm. in my career has been made by me hmm 
Today you have an entire team that's working with you. You have these young 17, 18 year olds. All you can do is concentrate, focus only on your songwriting or on your music or whatever. And everybody else is doing everything else for you. Mm. Whereas it was not like that for me. I had mm. to do it all. But where the album was concerned, I had a producer. Hmm. So that in some way, I suppose, took the load off. But um, it's important to know what your input is. It's important hmm. to know what you're capable of doing. And it's important to know your limitations hmm. more than anything else. Yeah. So that was one thing. There was no management in those days. There was no social media in those days. Hmm. I had to literally walk into the record stores and make sure that there were the right amount of CDs and it was visible enough for people to see so that when they walk in, they'll buy the damn thing, you know. Mm. And there was a, always a bone to pick, you know. I, I, I would keep bringing up the artist and a and uh, person in the, in the company and say, listen, it's not visible. People don't even know it's out or release some more CDs or whatever, you know. Mm. That was always a very big stress. Then I had a lot of family uh, support hmm. and uh, family and friends hmm. because of my parents support I was able to go wherever I wanted travel with my shows hmm. you know uh, they gave me the independence they gave me the liberty to do that and the essential difference of course nothing digital mm -hmm. I love those analog days everybody loved them but yeah. I mean the, the scope and the access is so much more today I mean they, they literally have to pick up their phone and yeah. Music is at their fingertips. It's huge. It's hugely mm. different. And But the good thing about it was that because it was so difficult to reach and access, there was always a mystery. And I kind of had the luxury of time. Mm. I had a, a six-year gap between mm. the release of Dhuan mm -hmm. and the release of Talash. Mm. Five to six-year gap, yeah. In 91 and 96. Mm -hmm. And uh, so after I released Pari, I mean, obviously, there was this image that was created and everybody wanted me to do a formula thing. You know, record company kept saying, come on, release something that's similar, similar, similar. And I never wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. Every song on my album was completely different and every album was completely different to mm -hmm. the others because I was yeah. working with different people and different aspects of my musicality uh, were used mm -hmm. in all of them. And, and I also I had a little bit of a social conscience. So I always had, um, you know, either it was for the girl child or it was, like I said, unnecessary importance given to money or Dhuwa was an anti-smoking, anti-drugs. Mm -hmm. So there was so much of variety. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so people never, never kind of, there was never overexposure. They never got fed up. And mm. um, they would, I would be asked in interviews, like, where have you been or whatever. But then if there's no album, then there's no interview. So I was happily doing my own thing. Mm. I could pursue other things. I could travel, you know, take breaks. Relationships up and down, you know, emotionally had to get stronger. There's so many things that go on. Yeah. But then, and then when people were expecting something, I gave them, from this angelic puri, suddenly I was in a short leather skirt on a blast furnace with flames all around me and smoldering eyes going mm. dheka dheka. Mm. They're like, whoa, what happened there? But they forgave me. They said, they, almost like from the angel to the devil I became. Mm. But they forgave me. And then after that, I came up with Kesariya. So once again, I was mm. this happy thing with mirror work, holding a matka, very mischievous. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, people just took whatever the hell I produced, even though it was so little. If you think about it, it's not like I had hit after hit, year after year, year after year. But what I did, I don't know, somehow people remembered, retained yes. and, and uh, still do yeah. and asked for it in my shows. And mm -hmm. God, I mean, who could ask for anything more? Mm. You know, so I think that's the biggest difference today. Today, yes, you have management. Yes, you have um, somebody who will tell you exactly how you have to chalk out your entire path, like where you're going to eventually reach already mm. when you're 17 years old. Mm. And you can, uh, you can actually do a lot of things and you can be known for it instantly. Mm. You can sit at home and you'll be known instantly. Yeah. But the thing is, then you can be forgotten as instantly. Mm. And to really, really make a mark, then you have to sustain and you have to do lots and you have to do it regularly and you should do it for a long time. Hmm. Otherwise, you won't. I sustained for such a long time and I don't feel I did so much, really. <laughs> hmm. But what it, I did stuck. Yeah. Uh, would you say that it's because um, the scarcity factor of it somehow boosted its value? Because it was so, it was in less supply. It was not formulaic. All of those things, but I think most importantly also it was my honesty hmm. and my um, what I would like to believe was authenticity. 
Hmm. I never tried to be something that I wasn't. I may hmm. have tried to be many things, maybe too many things sometimes. Hmm. But it was all about me and what I felt and what I thought and how I experienced the world, hmm. how how wonderful I thought it was. Um, my aesthetic was everywhere. Did you continue doing theatre? I continued doing theatre. I kind of came back to theatre after 10 years. After my mm. last play, which was in uh, 88, mm. then in 2000, I mm. did Man of La Mancha mm. with Dalip Tahil. Um, we did about 25 shows. That seems to be the thing, you know, 25 mm. shows of Greece, 25 shows of La Mancha. Mm. Evita, of course, we did hundreds. Bottoms Up, we did hundreds. And then I did an indigenous production called Garema mm. with Ishita Arun. She produced it. It was directed by Anaita Oberoi, mm. um, where I played a gospel singer, an American gospel singer, Indian lady, but living uh -huh. in America, singing gospel, whose son is addicted to drugs and alcohol. Mm. And uh, she, uh, she comes to India and goes back to the building where her best friend is an Indian classical singer. Mm. And her son is into music and how the two children bring the two friends together. They're both widows. Yeah. So that was a very interesting mm. musical. And then I did Monsoon Wedding. Uh, no, yeah. After after Man of La Mancha was Garima and then Monsoon Wedding, where I played mm. the role of Saroj Rai mm. with Mirana Air's production in Doha. Mm. So musicals kind of keep coming back to me. <laughs> Were you ever involved with the uh, financial or production aspects of um, either theatre as well as your shows? So... Oh. After every play, mm -hmm. I would get a princely sum of 100 rupees in a white envelope. <laughs> and when I played the lead role a few years later, I had mm -hmm. the even more princely sum of 200 rupees for sure. <laughs> so <laughs> we would be given the envelope mm -hmm. and then we would go to Shamiana or go mm -hmm. to Trattoria and the president. Mm -hmm. All of us would sit at a long table and eat our food, open the envelope and give it for the bill. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that was the commercials in theatre. Yeah. Um, Kind of became okay in the last the last couple of plays that I did. I, there was mm. a sizable, like a, not sizable in the sense, a mentionable amount of money that came, which went into the bank account as opposed to in an envelope. Mm. So, yeah. couple more zeros from from earlier. <laughs> but that's it, really. In theatre, so in theatre, there's not much money. You do it because yeah. you love it. Mm. Now, um, there's a very standard contract that you used to sign. You have your uh, one rupee per cassette you get and a couple mm -hmm. of rupees per CD. And so that was what I had. You know, like I said, I was a baby and I wrote off all my rights when I was a kid. Mm. And um, I was having so much fun that whatever came, came, you know. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I had a lot of help from my father, mm. you know, when it came to my shows. And he, he encouraged me to go where the money went, where the money came. He said, mm. if you're getting the show, do it. Mm. So then my economics and everything, all the applications, everything just fell by the wayside because I was getting work and mm. I had to get out on that stage. Mm. And uh, I'm very grateful that he made me do this because whatever I put away today is from the, that period of my life. Oh, wow. And uh, I know I could have maybe charged a little more mm. at one particular period, but I didn't have the right advice then. Mm. So I stuck to that particular thing. And so therefore I made that amount. Hmm. You know, considering the success of Pari, maybe there could have been uh, a better way to have managed my career. But that was what I knew best. Hmm. And I took whatever advice was given to me. And uh, I had my accountant and I had my wisdom and hmm. I managed like that, you know. And uh, it it wasn't really a business for me. Hmm. It never was a business for me. Today, definitely everything is a business. Hmm. No matter how genuine you are and how wonderful an artist you are. Right. You're entering the business of music. Hmm. Every decision that you make in that moment, it's what you knew best at the time. Correct. And you keep acting and you keep bashing on. And I think for me, the success aspect mm -hmm. is not commercial. It's a fact that I'm sitting with you today and talking to you, that you're interested yeah. in knowing about me, that you want to know how my career went and that somebody may learn some lessons yes. along the way. And... I still feel that I have my wits about me and I still want to do stuff and I'm alive. Hmm. So for me, that's success. Do you remember the uh, numbers uh, in terms of how many cassettes of which album? Um, see, see, when we launched Senorita, they said huh. that it went platinum. Hmm. What did platinum <laughs> so whatever mean? Platinum, I think it was about 75,000 cassettes oh. immediately, like huh. as soon as it was released. And I think it had a lot to do with the National Network Pop Time show. Yeah. 
I want to ask you about my favorite number, which is um, uh, Lage Mori. Wow. In the beginning, um, my albums were just straight away contemporary Western music mm-hmm. with Hindi lyrics. Yeah. That was my definition of Hindi pop. Hmm. Then the next album, I started using Indian instruments in Pari, in Parvana, in hmm. Dhua. In Dhua, we use the Kanjira. In Parvana, we use the Sitar. Hmm. In Pari, of course, a number of beautiful folk instruments and the flute. So as my, uh, and my, one of my biggest influences in, um, in music uh, was Shakti. Hmm. So um, I slowly came to know that the, it all really depends on the glue. Hmm. The glue that puts together the Western and the Indian element, the mm. contemporary and the classic. The glue yeah. is important. Sometimes it can turn out to be absolute crap. Mm. Sometimes it can turn out to be each one is trying to show off what they do individually and then the glue is really just not even fevicol. It's mm. not super glue. It's not fevicol. <laughs> it's not even glue drop. It's nothing. Mm. Um, so that glue was my permanent search. Mm. Some of them were really silly. Some of them worked. Some of them were like magic. So, Lagi uh, Morinen was one mm. such attempt. It, with all humility, I will say mm. that I used the Tumri mm. and uh, once again, my mama's influence. Mm. And, you know, there's this, uh, I used it as it was. I mm. didn't want to mess with it. Mm. But it went very beautifully with, an, with a Western melody which a friend of mine had composed. Mm-hmm. So I used, that's the line that you actually sang, that yeah. free me, yeah. touch me. And it just flowed beautifully into hmm. So it, it, the notes matched beautifully. And um, it had this kind of a soaring feel to it. And mm. uh, Sangeet Haldipur mm. just composed the most beautiful chord structure to that. And a string section. And that's how it was born. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> how, how did you proceed with uh, the release and if there was any marketing of that song? Mm. Yeah, so Lage Murinen was basically part of what I thought would be an album called Vakt. Hmm. Once again released into Oblivion. Hmm. Um, I'm not going to mention names, but a particular gentleman and a particular record company made a lot of promises. Mm. We even had a launch in the Hard Rock Cafe. Mm. And I had Gino, Sangeet, Sheldon, Mm. all of them, you know, we had a fabulous show. And he made us a limited number of CDs and Mm -hmm. he vanished. Oh. And uh, I was like, you know, what am I going to do? There's no, there was no contract. Because mm. we were friends, I was stupid. I just went about the whole thing in a very silly way. I just thought that, okay, we'll make the contract. We'll do it, we'll do it, we'll do it. Five years in the making, that album was. It mm. took me all the way to New York. I even worked with Lenny White. Mm. God. Mm. Um, on Vakt. And uh, I, I had made several demos with my musician friends like mm. Zubin Balaporia, Mahesh Tanaykar. They were mm. so helpful. And we actually made demos and ultimately the whole thing was then produced by Gino Sangeet and Sheldon. Hmm. So, but nobody knew. Nobody Hmm. knew the album was out. And uh, so many from Artist Aloud. We love each other. She's a a great friend of mine. Hmm. And uh, she said, Sunita, I'm going to take a few songs from Vakt and I'm going to put them onto Artist Aloud. Uh And a song called Indian Girl. I kind of made a little bit of a video of that also. And she put that Mm. out. So Lage Morinen is available on Artist Aloud. Uh, Could you tell us something about your practice routine? Oh, goodness me. (laughs) Both, not just Uh, voice, but also dance. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So, see, the thing is, if you're continuously doing shows, Mm -hmm. if you're in the groove, yeah. The most important thing is you're already oiling your vocal cords. You're already singing regularly, so mm-hmm. which is the most important. You just have to, if you're singing, you're singing regularly. If you're dancing, you dance regularly. If you're painting, you paint regularly. That's the main thing. You've honed your craft and you have to continuously do it. Mm-hmm. It's when you're not doing your shows mm-hmm. that you have to do your riyas. You have to practice regularly. I mean, there are people who even during tours, they get up and sing for two, three hours in the morning. I'm not going to claim ever to have done that. Mm-hmm. 
uh, you just have to look after your voice during that period and make sure you don't abuse. Um, but when I started out, mm -hmm. I was about, let's say, 15, yeah. uh, 15 and a half. Yeah, I was doing the rehearsal routine for Greece. Uh -huh. I had a paper on which I had written my routine in ballpoint pen mm. where I said, wake up at 6.15 and gargle, mm. do your warm-ups, have your breakfast, do this, do that. So I suppose mm. I did have a routine at some point in my mm. life. But, you know, the erratic nature of, of the industry, it should have been much more regular than it was. Mm. But I don't um. know. I'm, I just feel that, you know, a lot of the things are also psychological. Mm. especially where vocals are concerned. Mm. And, and, you know, the thing is, earlier on, Indian classical singers and teachers and stuff like that, they don't tell you exactly how to sing. They'll tell you what to sing. And you just, yeah. by sheer imitation and regularly doing it every day, you become amazing and you develop the strength. But mm. if you're not doing it regularly enough and you're not given the right technique, mm. then you can really damage yourself. Tell me a bit more about the psychological aspect of it. <laughs> what what goes on um what's the psyche behind putting up a great performance or uh giving doing a banger of a recording session see one of the most important things is that you have to have the passion and the confidence there's a mix hmm. you can't be overly passionate as in too emotional you can't be overconfident you mm. can't be underpassionate in the sense you can't be just doing it mechanically mm. and you can't be underconfident. There has to be this really delicate balance that you have to have. Mm. And of course, it comes with the earlier preparation. You have to be completely bang on. You've got to know your lyrics. I never use lyric stands. Mm. I never in my life read music on stage while performing. Mm. Only much, much later when I was performing with a band and there would be like, like a, you know, a uh, huge repertoire and you know you have sometimes you don't even know which song you're going to sing it depends on what the audience asks for mm -hmm. but I never did those too many of those gigs mainly mm -hmm. it was gigs with the choreography and dancing so I would sing for two and a half hours and not have a single lyric in front of me mm -hmm. I remembered all my lyrics so and with that comes a certain confidence mm -hmm. and, and you have to be very happy about the way you're looking mm -hmm. you have to figure that out from before like yeah. you, you spend time <laughs> on it Mm. You know, uh, know, know who you want to come across as. Mm. And it doesn't have to be the same all the time. But when you're doing it in that particular period, you have to know who you are. Mm. So it's, it's how, you're, how you have to know your material. You have to know how you want to present yourself. You have to love what you're doing. You have to be healthy enough. Mm. And you have to trust I think I just gave you the formula for a kick-ass gig. <laughs> <laughs> and and how has it been a balancing motherhood and artistry? You know, you know, right through. Um, I always wanted to be a mom, mm. always, and it's not like I purposely had a baby much later. It was like mm. I was very, very happy when I was in a relationship. I was quite clear that yeah, I mean, I'm you're gonna have my baby, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But it never happened because the person was not right. Mm. But I think that kind of worked out for me because mm. I was able to have a solid chunk of my career mm. before she was born. Mm. Because I'll be honest, I mean, I know people say, oh, woman, you know, work, baby, motherhood, career, everything. We are all juggling. We are multitasking, blah, blah, blah. Mm. I do believe that human beings can't really truly multitask. If yeah. you're going to multitask, you're going to be doing a kind of an okay, 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 okay job at everything. Mm. You got to focus for one th at uh, focus on one thing at one time. Mm. Even if if it's just for those two days or for those two minutes or five minutes, you have to really, really focus on something and then move on to the next thing. Only mm. thing, only then can you really do justice. Mm. I don't believe that if if I had my my daughter during those days, that mm. I would have done justice to her. Yeah. Uh, when my baby was born, I was with her 24-7. Mm. Maybe I had maids, maybe I had help at home. Yeah. But I'm a hands-on mom even today. I have to. I want to be with her. I want to be home every day when she comes home from school. I want to say bye to her in the morning. Mm. Uh, I want to be there when she needs me, even if I'm in the next room. So 
for me, I'm really, really grateful that I was able to do so much and I was able to have a child. And mm. this is very individually speaking. I don't want all, you know, all my, my fraternity to come up in mm. arms and say, how can you say that? You know, I want to be able to do both at the same time. Sure, do yeah. it if you feel you can do it. Mm. But just remember when you need to focus on what. Mm. And today, if I do anything and if I need to leave the country or leave the city, yeah. I know now she's mature enough and I can do it. Mm. So it is a personal choice, but also it has to be a practical one. Personal and practical. Yeah, perfect. Um, so what are you currently working on? I'm at the moment rehearsing for a lovely show, actually. It's going to be on the 3rd of December at St. Andrew's Auditorium. And I'm going to be singing with a bunch of other artists. And they've called the show That Christmas and you know, that Christmas Spirit and so much more. <laughs> they had mm. uh, Darren Das is doing it. Mm -hmm. And Darren used to be one of my dancers. Mm. And one of my first dancers. He's even choreographed quite a few songs for me. And I was the one who gave him his first opportunity as a singer. Mm. I had the minus one of Jailhouse Rock uh -huh. and I gave it to him and I said, here, I'm going to take a break and you come on stage and sing. And he has this lovely big baritone. And uh, he started singing after that. And today mm. he's running the show. It's really lovely. So, um, yeah, I'm singing for Darren and uh, that's going to be in Bandra. So whoever's mm. that side of town on the 3rd of December, if it's not already sold, go get your tickets. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. And uh, I was on the jury of Ladli again recently. Uh -huh. And I'm sincerely practicing and pursuing my Bharatnatyam, which I'm very, very, very uh, absorbed with. It's, 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 con it's consuming me right now. And um, I am also blatantly telling everyone that I've sent out a bunch of casting videos and pictures. And um, I was actually approached earlier on in my career mm -hmm. to act. And a number of Actually, people who I have a great, great respect for, mm -hmm. you know, I actually told them that, no, listen, I'm I'm focusing on my music. I mm. can't act now. And they were like movie offers and stuff earlier mm. in my career. And I never did it. And I'm quite glad I didn't because I'm much more of a singer dancer than an actor. Mm. At least I was. Mm. Um, but my uh, acting has been utilized, of course, in musical theater. But, and yeah. I did a couple of TV series long ago and stuff like that. But I would really, really love to sink my teeth into a lovely role. <laughs> <laughs> that's lovely that's lovely thank you so much for being here for making the time and sharing your wonderful rich experience with us and parting words first of all you know this whole podcast thing mm -hmm. it's wonderful because mm -hmm. I know the reach that it has and um, I'm really really hoping that you know whatever it is that I've said I, I hope the main thing that comes across to all of you is that Everything that you do has to come from a true, true, honest place in your heart. And I know it's difficult. Things can get very, very difficult. You have a lot of people who will try to bring you down. You'll have a lot of obstacles. Mm. But the main thing is you have to have faith in yourself. And you have to trust that everything's going to be okay. And don't get overwhelmed, overwhelmed by your ultimate goal. Have your goal in your sight. But the main thing is act Today, because action, I think action removes fear. Mm. The moment you do something, you're too busy doing it and you can't worry about it. Mm. And you'll have your slumps and you'll have your lows. But pick yourself up and just all you need is 30 seconds of courage and two minutes of action and everything can change in an instant.